Good morning, First Baptist family. It's so good to be uh, here with you, uh, recording this video. Um, as you may have heard, we have um, have had several technical difficulties over the last few months, and probably even longer than that um, with our live streaming. Uh, so we're going to take a break from live streaming, and uh, I will upload a message, uh, my sermon, on our social media platforms, on uh, Facebook and YouTube for everyone. Uh, this isn't a long-term solution. Uh, this is for right now until we can find someone or someones uh, to help us to get our live stream up and going right, correctly, somebody that can be here that's not already part of the worship team or myself that can um, be in charge of um, just live streaming. Uh, we will be doing this. Uh, so if you know anyone, if you think of anyone, if you'd like to volunteer, we would love to help uh, train you in whatever way we can. Um, so, yeah, this week's message uh, comes from, we're continuing Isaiah. So we're on chapter 36. I'm going to read verses 4 to 10 and 13 to 20. Um, the field commander said to to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says, on what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have counsel and might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff, which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Jude and Jerusalem, You must worship before this altar. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you were depending on Egypt for, pharaohs, for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mistreat you, mislead you. When he says the Lord will deliver us, have the gods of any nations ever delivered their hands from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Seravim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all gods of these countries have been able to save their lands from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from their hand? Let's pray. God, we thank you, uh, Lord, for your word. God, we thank you for the prophet Isaiah, uh, Lord, for, for what he spoke out, Lord, for listening to you and prophesying, uh, Lord, what you called him to in the midst of that time, Lord. I pray that you would speak into our hearts this morning, Lord. Teach us, guide us, Lord. Help us to follow you, Lord. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the sermon uh, for today is the future of First Baptist Church of Pittman. Really, it's, I think, maybe the future of the church in general. So in this text, um, we have Assyria attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Um, now the Assyrian army is at Jerusalem. They're holding it under siege. They blocked the water from going in. Uh, so it kind of looks dismal already. It didn't look good at all for Judah. And so you have this field commander who's trying to persuade the people of Judah to turn from Hezekiah and to surrender to Assyria. You know, saying, join us. You know, the Lord's on our side. We got God, you know. We wouldn't do this unless God told us to do it. You know, God told us to destroy Jerusalem. God won't help you. You know, things did not look good at all for the people of Judah. And I'm sure that the people of Judah were discouraged 
We're scared. We're disheartened. We're fearful and not sure what to do. It almost sounds like the church today. You know, things don't look good. I mean, even before COVID, the church was having problems. The church overall. You know, I mean, you can go through the stats where it says that church attendance, I think it was Gallup poll, said the church attendance is down to below 50%. And that's between mosques, uh, synagogues, and churches below 50%. First time in 70 years. Uh, and you can look at other numbers of people exiting the church. You know, these there's so many statistics out there that show you that things don't look good. And it's enough to be discouraged and scared and disheartened and fearful, not sure what, what to do going forward. But I think there's also some things that we can pull out of this text to help us to learn, to, to grow, and to, to see how we can move forward. Um, first, it, it's, it's okay to remove high places in our churches today. You know, in, in the passage... Uh, the field commander said, you know, God's upset with y'all because you destroyed the high places and the altars. Didn't, are, where are you going to worship now? According to Bible Gateway, a high place was usually an elevated geographic site. In the Old Testament, it takes on specialized meaning of being a place of worship ordinarily situated on a hill or mountain and commonly associated with false religions. Uh, basically, it's an open-air shrine. Sometimes they were used to worship God, but most of the time uh, they were not. So high places could be where and what we worship. Um, they can become idols in our churches. There was a term that was used um, for many years, still used today, but I, I don't like the term, so I'm not going to use it. So I'm going to use the term idol or high places. Um, but according to Jared Moore, um, uh, this term, so I'm going to use idol in that phrase. An idol in the church is a tradition that has been exalted to a position of normalcy, considered respectable in Christianity. They are virtually immune. Um, oh, they are often hard to get rid of because they are accepted and considered respectable in Christianity. They are virtually immune from criticism. So these high places that we can have in our churches, these idols that we can have, they're virtually immune from criticism. They're the things that we could not imagine giving up. We think that they're they're warranted, that they've been around for so long that we couldn't imagine getting rid of it. You know, it's those phrases like, it's um, this is the way we've always done it, or we've never done it that way before. Um, it's never been done that way. That's not what, what church is. That's not what we've been doing for the last hundred or more years. So what are these idols that we can have in our churches? Let's start with physical things, right? You've heard me say it before, pews. You know, the pews, pews are, are rows, divide, and differentiate. You know, pews um, are rows that make people all about spectators, right? So we have these pews and we think that's the way it's always been done. I think tables, you know, I've said it to several people, that's where it's at, you know, because that's real community, conversation, connection, friendship based around a table, not when you're facing each other's back of your heads in the same space, you know, a communion table. I read about a church that got upset because the communion table was moved over to the side and you're taking Jesus out of the focus of the center. But Jesus can still be the center no matter what. You know, churches that hold room sacred, chandeliers, offering plates, you know, anything with a gold plaque that we have. All these physical things can become idols, these high places that really take our focus off of Jesus, off of God, and place it on these things, our buildings themselves can become high places. I'm thankful that we're in a space where we don't allow that to be the case, you know. I'm thankful that the church years ago uh, allowed the Pittman Food Pantry to move in. Over 16 years of being able to feed the hungry out of our church. You know, recently, Fig Leaf Thrift, you know, a year and a half, you know, we took over space so that we could clothe people as Jesus called us to do you know we've allowed a music school to come and use our space space that wasn't being used you know we had a youth center going for a little while partially and now we're rebuilding that and hoping to use our space more for the community and I'm sure that over the years even before I got here that the church has been used for the community in countless ways and that's what it's about and we other things that we, we cling to, maybe our Sunday mornings, right? We, 
we say that Sunday mornings are where it's at. You know, at least that's where we, how we make it out to be. It's our main focus for the whole week. You know, 60 to 90 minutes on a Sunday, depending. Um, and we spend all this time and money, resources, um, just to to do an hour, to an hour and a half. You know, this is, but we cling to those. You know, maybe it's not what we're supposed to do. You know, the worship wars of the 90s, for those that have been in the church uh, around the block a few times, you know, been around the church, you've seen the worship wars where you had people upset about guitars in church or, you know, not just doing hymns, doing other music as well, and people fighting with one another. And it's still going on today. I mean, 30, almost 30 years later, it's still going on. The funny part is, is when I was in the history of worship um, class at seminary, I learned that it was just as problematic to bring the organ into the church, that churches would not have it. Um, very interesting. You know, dress codes, they become these high places. You know, you have to wear certain clothes to come to church. And many of us have probably have stories about being told that we had to dress up for church. I still remember a lady telling me one Sunday that I should be wearing a three-piece suit to church every week, that every man should be wearing that. Um, I still remember that. And you know, that's why we get the phrase Sunday best, because we, we save our best clothes for Sunday. But it's not about the outside, it's about our hearts. Amen. Programs, events, you know, we do we do these things, we keep doing them because we've always done them. They are these high places, these idols in our churches, you know, like we do annual events that are no longer relevant. I remember uh, in past churches that's happened just because we've always done it that way. Um, even beliefs, some of our beliefs that we've been taught over the years aren't always biblical because we don't check it. We just believe when we continue to pass it on to others. We don't question anything. We're told never to question. Um, but it's okay to question. It's okay to question all this. Why do we do what we do? You know, why do we have to do this? Do we have to do this? Do we? Why do we believe this? You know, questioning is not wrong. And we can't always just point back to the good old days, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, we will never return to those days. Life is so much more different now. It doesn't mean that we have to keep everything or that we have to throw everything away. It's whatever brings us closer to Jesus, whatever allows us to serve God and to serve others, to love God and to love others. That's what we should keep doing it. That's why Hezekiah said we need to get rid of the high places was so that people would put their focus where it should be, not on themselves, not on specific things, but on God, God's self. The church does not need uh, to rely on the related, the latest church trends or gimmicks or programs to see, um, to survive or to see growth. So in, in the text, once again, you have this field commander says, man, even if we give you 2,000 horses, you would still be defeated. You don't have enough trained horsemen to ride on them. According to John Oswald, he's a scholar, he said that mounted cavalry was new to the scene around this time. And that's what they're talking about here is the mounted cavalry. Um, it was better than riding in a war chariot. Before this, you were had to be in a chariot. But riding on a horse, you're more flexible, you're more mobile, you can go to more spots, and you can go a whole lot faster than in a chariot. So it's like the latest innovation, the latest development, the latest uh, military technique then. And so it made me think about, isn't that what we do with churches too? That we focus so much on the latest innovation, the latest technique. You know, what's the latest church trend? What are churches doing? What are the successful churches doing? What's the latest church growth plan? And there are countless books on this topic of church growth. And they've been around for years. And I don't think they've done a whole lot of good for most churches. You know, I'm sitting in my office now looking into my closet and Going years ago, I remember when I first got here, I was cleaning out my closet. I found all these books up there, books from the 70s, 80s, and maybe even before that. And maybe there was quite a few books on church growth at that point. I don't think I kept them. I still have a lot of books over on my shelves. But, um, you know, we go to these because we think that people have found the secret to church growth. You know, this will make any church grow. And I just think about, wow, the pride of those who think they have it all figured out. <laughs> you know, they're like, my God will show you how to grow the church in four easy steps. 
but what is success? You know, like this, yeah, they say this is the way to success. And these are the strategies you have to use. And so we think of them as the successful ones. So we have to do, we must do what they do. But what is success? What do we really view as success? I mean, you look at the, the ABCs of church success, they say. Attendance, buildings, and cash. Or the three Bs of church success. Buildings, budgets, and butts. But is that really what success is about? Is that really what we have been called to do. So we, we create these program-driven churches to, to, to meet these things, to, to hit these, you know, to, to have a high attendance, to, to have the biggest budget, to have the most butts in our seats. And so you add programs, think it's going to believe to church, and the number of programs grow. And so then we create these consumer-driven churches where people pick and choose what best church or pick and choose which they get from which church. Or you have a tractional church model, which fits just with this, right? You know, that was the trend for the longest time, man. Create an awesome show on Sunday mornings and people will come. You know, great music, great pastor that people will love to hear him talk and share. You know, just put on great things and maybe even give out free coffee, free food. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll throw up some bounce houses and do a whole lot of stuff just to attract people to church, give free stuff. You know, every <clears throat> every holiday, give out thank you gifts to everyone that comes to church, especially the visitors. You know, programs come and go. Things that are popular come and go. But having more, I tell you, it's going to lead to burnout. And often it does. I mean, you, you can't do everything and you can't do even most things well. You know, it's it's not chasing after the latest church growth stream. What works in one context doesn't mean it's going to work in another context. You know, church isn't about busyness. I think that so much we get so busy in all these different things that it distracts us from the purpose and mission of the church. We need community, not programs. We need fellowship, not to follow the latest trends. You know, so much we, we complicate church. When God calls us to make it simple, when Jesus summed up the law in two things, it really fits with the church as well. He said we're supposed to do two things as followers of Jesus. And I believe that the church are, is called to do these two things too. Love God and love others as we love ourselves. And churches that do that are churches that are fulfilling the kingdom of God, the mission of the kingdom of God. And we can't allow the discouragement or criticism of others to pull us from where God has called us to be. The three officials of, from Judah try to get the field uh, commander to speak in Aramaic so that the others, that the, the other people in Judah won't understand what he's saying. The field commander told the people not to trust Hezekiah, but to come and make peace with the king of Assyria. You know, the field commander's trying as much as he can to make the people of Judah believe that their situation is ho uh, hopeless. He's trying to discourage them, telling them that they have they've, they've got nothing. You can't defend yourselves. There's nothing you can do on your own that you have to give up, that you must wave that white flag now. He wants to discourage. He wants to dishearten. And he wants those people to turn on Hezekiah. Hezekiah is leading the wrong way. He's trying to scare them. Put fear into them. It's almost like it's psychological warfare. Has anyone ever been discouraged? Those voices of doubt, those voices of discouragement, those critical voices, you know, other people. But what about ourselves? You know, I don't know about you, but I don't need to always need other people to discourage me. You can ask Tina. I do a good job and myself, as I've said before here, I'm sometimes my worst critic. You know, I, I, I can get myself discouraged. Um, many different things. I mean, looking at statistics and research and seeing the future of the church, what they're predicting the future of the church. Um, how I see mainline denominations like our, our church um, denomination and so many others that, you know, churches are closing on the daily Many churches every year, thousands upon thousands of churches closing every year. It's enough to discourage us. And seeing the, the successes of other churches 
and wondering why we're not successful as well. Or maybe it's reading the stories or, or listening to the stories on TikTok of people who have left the church and will never return. You know, we could be honest. I mean, we could give up. We could give up, right? And honest, there are times that I want to give up, that I just want to walk away. I'm, I'm being honest here. Uh, you know, I've thought about um, what I would do if I wasn't a pastor. Maybe return back to working with coffee. I, I do miss that. You know, it's it's so easy for us to stop, to, to be discouraged, to allow the criticism of the loudest voices to stop us from what we're doing, you know? To keep looking at the way that we've always measured success and say that's the way that Jesus measured success. You know, when you gather with others and people are like, well, what's your average weekly attendance? Which comes up. I mean, you meet with pastors and they talk about that. You do surveys or research statistics and they ask you that. You sign up for, for workshops and they ask you that question. I know sometimes it's just so that they have the stats, but man, when you got to write that down time and time again or talk about it time and time again. You know, it's easy when to be discouraged when you listen to or follow the voices of success or measure success by the wrong standards, you know, or maybe people who question you or question how we do things at the church, you know, criticize for the way that we do church. You're not doing it right. That's not church. Or the people that are always like, well, where are they on Sunday mornings? We're helping them throughout the week. Why aren't they here on Sundays? Is that the measure of it? Or where's the Bible study? Where's the formal theological discussion? You know, why are you doing this and not doing that? It must be done this way. You know, no one likes to be criticized, <laughs> right? But man, Christians are sometimes the most vicious people. Because people like to criticize what they don't understand, what they don't agree with, beliefs that they don't adhere to. Because it goes against what they've always been taught or what they've always done. And some of the greatest Christians over time were deemed heretics because they did not fit into the mold that was prescribed to them. They were discouraged from continuing in their ways. They were criticized for their beliefs and actions. I'll be honest, people have told me, um, I've told others not to follow me, <laughs> that I'm a heretic. You know, it is what it is. Carrie uh, Newoff, who um, does a lot of research on churches and writes about a lot, in an article recently wrote, Many of the ideas that you'll see in the church in 2022 will be criticized and dismissed until they're not. But that's how innovation works. The leaders we criticize today will be the leaders who coach us tomorrow. Right, we got to take hope in things like that because I believe that God is speaking through people like that. And that's the voice that we should be listening to. The voice of God. That's the one voice, the only voice that we should be listening to. And God does speak through God's people. God speaks through God's word. God speaks through circumstances and in other ways to us. And that's where we should be listening. Not to these critical voices, to these voices that are disheartening and discouraging that are causing us to fear. I mean, how many times did, did God tell us throughout Scripture to do not fear, but have courage? Last weekend, I had a great opportunity to spend time at ABC and J annual session. That's our denominational region um, annual meeting up in Woodbridge this year. And I got to spend time talking with people and sharing about what we're doing in our church and people see what we're doing. And it was great because God encouraged me through those people. I needed to be there to hear that encouragement. You know, I had other pastors come up to me, even especially seasoned pastors that have been in ministry for 20, 30, 40 years, saying how they are all excited about what we're doing at our church. Because I believe we're on the right path. And God spoke through them to me, and I'm speaking it to you today. That we're there. We're getting there. We're going. The people in this text were told not to respond to the field commander. Hezekiah said, don't say anything to the field commander. Sometimes it's better not to respond, right, to the, to the voices in our head, or maybe those emails or voicemails you get. Sometimes it's just 
the delete button is the most freeing thing. You know, anything that's discouraging, dismissive, or critical, you know, especially when it's not truth, we don't need to listen. I believe that we as a church are headed in the right direction, that we are doing what God is calling us to do. You know, I don't believe we're there yet. I think there's still work to do. I'm ready for it. We haven't arrived yet. We're going to keep going. We need to continue to, to lean into God, to, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to walk the road that Jesus walked. I invite us to all pray for our church and other churches to be bold, to step out in faith, to not just keep doing things because we've always done them that way, but to do the kingdom work that God has called us to do, to love God and to love others as we love ourselves. If we do those things, then we will be successful. Amen? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this time, God, and we thank you, God, for all that you do for us, God, for the blessings that you pour out upon us, Lord. God, we thank you for this church, God, and we thank you for other churches, God, that are stepping out in faith, God, that are being bold, God, and we pray that more would be courageous, God, that more would step out in faith and to, to really do what, God, you have called them to do, Lord, to be places where, where we love God, where we love you, where we love others as we love ourselves, where we love each other in the church building, God, but that the love spills out into the community, God, and that we are meeting the needs, not only of the people in our building, God, but the people outside of our building, Lord. I pray that we would preach the gospel with our words, but also with our actions and all that we do and all that we say as a church, in the church and in the community, God. Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide us, Lord, continue to lead us and other churches, Lord, that are really seeking you, God, to live out the gospel in our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone. So just stay tuned. As I said, you know, we're this isn't a long-term solution. We are really hoping to have someone or someones to be able to get our live stream ministry up and going again. Um, so reach out to me if you uh, would like to be that person or persons, um, and we can go from there. We'll see what we can do in order to make this a great experience for everyone. Much love to all of you, and please don't ever hesitate to reach out if you need prayer or need to talk. We're here for you, and we love you all. Peace.